Okay. Thank you, everybody, um, for coming to what I believe is a truly historic gathering uh, and a panel here. We're going to be speaking for about 40 minutes um, and get to questions right away. Um, but first, um, I've asked each of our panelists uh, to introduce themselves briefly for two minutes because I believe they can do more justice to themselves than I can do for them. So, Colleen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Colleen Raleigh. I'm a retired FBI agent and former legal counsel in the Minnesota office of the FBI. Uh, retired in 2004, and I was known as the 9-11 whistleblower for um, revealing some of the failures to uh, read the memos before 9-11. My name's Annie Machon, and I used to be an intelligence officer for MI5 way back in the 1990s before resigning in order to blow the whistle about a whole series of crimes that I and my former partner witnessed on the inside. And this included files on government ministers, bombs that could and should have been prevented, innocent people being thrown in prison, illegal phone taps, and an illegal assassination plot against Colonel Gaddafi. For this, we had to go on the run, literally around Europe. Uh, my partner went to prison not once, but twice and our reputations were shredded in the media. Because of all these experiences, I'm now very much a civil rights activist, a writer, and a public speaker, and I take great interest in all the issues around whistleblowing, and particularly the current case of Edward Snowden, who I think is an absolute hero. Hi, I'm Jessalyn Radak. I um, worked at the Justice Department uh, before I became a whistleblower. And after also being put through a living hell, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to representing whistleblowers. Um, I didn't imagine that that would entail defending people charged with espionage for telling the truth. But that is uh, the bulk of my clientele right now, um, including NSA's Thomas Drake, right here. Yes, uh, Thomas Drake, former senior executive with the National Security Agency, uh, became a whistleblower shortly after 9-11, uh, which to my horror, recognized that the government had unchained itself from the Constitution and decided to embark on the foundational programs, which Edward Snowden has disclosed in quite a bit of detail, um, secret surveillance programs uh, that were done in the greatest uh, off, off the you know, public venue. No one knew about them for many, many years. Uh, I blew the whistle internally with two 9-11 congressional investigations. I blew the whistle on multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, also blew the whistle on the ca incalculable loss of intelligence, in which NSA is actually highly culpable with respect to its responsibility for 9-11 and conveniently hid behind uh, the FBI and the CIA and let them take the heat. Um, I ultimately made a fateful decision to go to a reporter. Uh, as a result, I was placed under investigation for a number of years, uh, ultimately charged in a 10 felony count indictment in 2010, uh, five counts of espionage, obstruction of justice, making false statements, facing 35 years in prison. But I s sit here before you as a free human being, and I cannot even begin to tell you what it means to keep your freedom. And so... <laughs> Justin Radak became my voice in the court of public opinion when I had no voice during all my pre-trial uh, proceedings. I've dedicated the rest of my life to defending life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and I'm Ray McGovern, and I can't tell you how honored I feel to be sitting up here with real whistleblowers. <laughs> uh, Jessalyn and Tom, and Colleen are winners of the Sam Adams Award for Integrity in Intelligence, Colleen being the first one 12 years ago. Sam Adams, some of you who were here Wednesday and heard my keynote, realized that Sam Adams was the one who had it right with respect to how many South Vietnamese there were under arms and how he was dissed and how he went through the system and did not whistle blow and neither did I. Now, after I saw my profession of intelligence analysis being prostituted, really, being corrupted for the express purpose 
of deceiving our elected representatives out of their constitutional prerogative to declare or otherwise authorize war, well, then I, I suppose I became a, a whistleblower late in life. And I've been de de uh, devoting my life to uh, getting enough truth out there so that people can really know what's going on if they take the trouble to look on the web, on the internet, because the fourth estate is dead in our country if it were not for the fifth estate concretized by what I see out here in this sea of faces, we would be in trouble deep. We're not in trouble deep, and all hell is breaking loose in Washington as I speak because of one gutsy guy named Edward Snowden and others who set the path for him to, to follow. So it's, a, it's a, a note of hope, of unaccustomed hope, that I bring here and in witnessing what is going on just in the last few days since we left the U.S. Uh, uh, indeed, just the events of, of just even the past six months um, in seeing how, how truly oppressive our country is um, mm -hmm. in, in new ways with new technologies and you know, even though perhaps the methods may be different, the oppression, the source of oppression is the same. Um, and Ray, I think you had an interesting historical insight into that that I think would be a good jumping off point for this. Yeah, I was, it wasn't an operational spy, I was kind of a bookish spy. And I brought this book along with me, it's Defying Hitler by Sebastian Hafner. Some of you will know Sebastian Hafner, his real name was Raymond Pretzel. He was a young lawyer in Berlin as he watched what was happening in 1933. He starts, uh, I just have a, a paragraph or two to read from this. I think you'll get the picture. Uh, the reference point, of course, is simply the technological skills that are at work here combined with two things, courage and the willingness to accept risk, to step out there, and those things are concretized by Julian Assange, by Bradley Manning, by these folks up here, and by Edward Snowden. Conscience, courage, and expertise. So here is the, uh, a little foreword written by Sebastian Hafner. It quotes uh, Richard Möhring, who went by the pen name of Peter Gahn, and there's only 10, ten lines here. But first, the most important thing. What are you doing in these great times? Great, I say, for times seem great to me when each man driven half to death by the error's hate and standing in the place he's given must willy-nilly contemplate no less a thing than his own being. A little breath, a second's wait may well suffice. You catch my meaning? Sebastian Hafner was in Berlin, 1933, and one of the things that he said uh, was that it was really bizarre because he could see what was happening, and the way he put it, there are a few things as odd as the calm, superior indifference with which I and those like me watch the beginnings of the Nazi revolution in Germany, as if from a box at the theater. As if from a box at the theater. After all, I can see no one to blame uh, if the Germans believed that uh, uh, the Reichstag was, uh, the destruction of the Reichstag was the work of the communists. What I do find blameworthy is the sheepish, submissiveness, the sheep of, sheepish submissiveness with which the German people accepted that as a result of the fire, each one of them had lost what personal freedom they were accustomed to by the Constitution, as though it followed as a necessary consequence. If the communists burned down the Reichstag, they were deprived of their rights under the Constitution as though it followed as a necessary consequence. And lastly,
The sequence of events, wholly within the normal range of psychology, but it helps me to explain the almost inexplicable. The only thing that is missing is what in animals is called breeding. There is a solid inner kernel that cannot be shaken by external pressures and forces, something noble and steely, a reserve of pride principle, dignity to be drawn on on the hour of trial. At the moment of truth, when other nations sometimes rose to the occasion, the folks in Germany collectively and limply collapsed and had a nervous breakdown. The result of this million-fold nervous breakdown was that a nation ready for anything today is the nightmare of the rest of the world, 1933. Now, there are incredible analogies here. If the terrorists knocked down the Twin Towers, doesn't it follow as night the day that we should be deprived of the freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution? Where is that steely reserve? Where is that breeding that sets us apart? Well, I see the breeding right out here. I see people not only technically qualified, but I see people with consciences, you know? I see people who are willing to risk the freedoms, the freedoms that they have, like Tom did, for the general good. And that is really something so uplifting that we should look around and just look at, look at one another and say, you know, there are enough of us here. There are enough of us. We can step up to this. We can have the breeding, the steely resolve that it takes to turn our freedoms into real freedoms, not ones that are circumscribed by this kind of intrusive eavesdropping and other indignities. Wow, that, that was absolutely amazing, and I completely, completely agree with you about the parallels identified with what was going on at the beginning of Nazi Germany and what I believe is happening today and has been happening since 9-11. Um, one of the things that I'd like to get out of this panel and one of the things that many people have been asking me for are a set of concrete solutions. You know, what, what, what can we do? You know, what can the crowd out there do? What can the people listening on the streams do? Um, and I hope that we'll be able to get that out of this panel, and I trust that we will. And um, Colleen, I believe you had an excellent foundation for where to start um, with that kind of action when talking about ethics. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's not terribly original idea because it was the first thing proposed in our Congress after the, the collapse of Enron and WorldCom was mandatory ethics training for these corporations that it, uh, you know, were at, to blame. Uh, Jess and I were both in the ethics department in our agencies. Um, I taught law and ethics to FBI agents, and, and Jess did as well. And as simplistic as it sounds, and there's this argument that you can't teach ethics, that you have to be born with a conscience, uh, there's an argument that way. I know of many, many examples, um, even to include in the FBI when they founded the first ethics training, the very first whistleblowers became those three guys that were tasked with teaching ethics because somehow it seeped in. Um, and I, I saw this over and over when I would give training, there would be people afterwards that would come to me almost in a confessional type thing. So one of the things that can, you can do, it ties in with what Ray just um, went through, which is the lessons of history. That is part of ethics training, learning from history. Uh, another key thing from uh, ethics training is that it was my talk, secrecy enables wrongdoing. It enables all crime. Secrecy is the problem. The opposite in ethics is called the grandmother test. Would you do it if your grandmother was looking over your shoulder? Would you do this thing if, um, if uh, it was going to be in the front page of the paper? It's the opposite of secrecy. There are easy ways to reduce secrecy, but it, if one thing that people can do is in your uh, private or public uh, uh, employment or even in your um, you know, hobbies or whatever, demand that there be some uh, ethics training. 
uh, that there, there be some because you'd be surprised and all it takes is one or two people to take it seriously that will really help. No, I, I absolutely agree. That's a, that kind of foundation, I think. And just thinking about it, just taking a moment, you know, I, as we were talking earlier, Ray, so many of the people who, are, who work in intelligence and who work in these things, and, you know, don't really have time to think about the bigger picture or look at the bigger issue. And even in what, what we do and lead our daily lives, you know, for those of us that aren't in intelligence, that, you know, how are we making a positive contribution to the things that we do every single day? Um, Tom, you had a very, very interesting point um, earlier that I, that I think would be appropriate at this time um, in talking about the sovereignty of the individual and protecting the sovereignty of the individual against the tyranny of the state. If you could, you know. Each and every one of you in this audience are sovereign human beings. You have inalienable rights. No one, no one can take those away from you. The state, the surveillance state, the secrecy regime has to take that away from you. Otherwise, it cannot exist. So why consent to having them do so against us? Secrecy is for losers. Protecting privacy and our sovereignty is for winners. That makes the difference. Um, is there anybody in the panel that would like to follow up? Or Je Jesslyn or? Okay. Well, I just wanted to make one comment. Well, a couple of comments, of course. But the first one being that I've found it very interesting working and talking to so many people from America who are, have blown the whistle, who are conscious of the erosions of what they thought to be their inalienable rights, mm -hmm. their basic freedoms that were enshrined by a constitution. I come from Britain. We've never had a written constitution. And our spies have run amok with impunity for a century doing precisely what you're all um, annoyed and angry about now. <laughs> so it's almost like you're sort of stampeding into the future, this sort of you British style dystopia, which is a bit worrying, and learning some very bad lessons from us. But I think coming from Europe, there is such a strong sense, there should be such a strong sense of what we did achieve over the centuries, 500, cent uh, 500 years plus, of fighting for basic rights you know, the right of freedom of conscience even with the religious wars early on, the right of women, the right not to be slaves, the right not to be tortured, the right to due process, the right to privacy, the right to a fair trial, all these things were fought for by our ancestors and it cost them blood and pain and misery, but they thought it was worth fighting for and they won it. And I suppose the apotheosis of that was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights put in place in 1948 when the horrors of the Second World War were still in place. And what we're seeing now in Europe, I think, now is a lazy complacency of people who are just too comfortable. They don't understand the previous sacrifices. We need to remember that history and that cost and that sacrifice. And we need to stand up to preserve what few rights are still in place from that apotheosis. So we need to fight for that. And this carries on, not just from the, the real world of war and blood and guts, but into the, the cyber world, of course, where exactly the same arguments are being played out again about privacy, about freedom to read the information you want, be it books, which were burnt, or websites, the freedom to express what you want without fear of being watched and without fear of censorship and without fear of being put on some blacklist, which means you can be snatched out of your house because you have said something. And this is what we are sliding towards, I think, now in the West. And we need to all come together and work out ways where people coming out of the intelligence agencies can work with people with the technical skills. And we're seeing this increasingly with WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden and things, but just to build that synergy that energy, that enthusiasm to protect what we have and what we're in danger of losing. So I urge all of you to please read your history, get involved, get teched up, and get into your rights as well and fight for them. It's just too important not to. I agree. Um, obviously, we fought an entire revolution to try to have what is contained in the United States Bill of Rights. The first one, the very first one, because it was so important, which enshrined freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, and freedom of assembly. Now, there's some people in the U.S. 
who would easily call this a conspiracy. A conspiracy to do what? I don't know, but there may be some future harm that we haven't imagined up yet that we could have committed. We have been disregarding our civil liberties, which often happens in a time of crisis. The United States tends to infringe on civil liberties. We saw it with the Alien and Sedition Acts. We saw it with the interning of Japanese prisoners, and we saw it after 9-11. We took away tons of civil liberties, and President Obama was elected because people thought he would rein that in. But instead of the pendulum swinging back and reaching some sort of equipoise, it swung even further. He took the secrecy regime and expanded it beyond what Bush could even do, because he's a Democrat and people like him, and he's one of us, or we thought. Um, so being, even being at this conference shows to me that you are politically aware and paying attention to this stuff, but a lot of you are also considerably younger than we are up here, so I hope that we can encourage you to, as you forge ahead in your careers, um, to be paying attention to this stuff. You have so many choices in front of you, and you can go work for a defense contractor, or you can go work on building tour. I mean, there's so many choices that you have right now um, ahead of you, and I really do hope we can help shape those in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, before we go to question, questions, I just have I, have, I have one question of my own that I hope we could perhaps just address real quickly right here. Uh, one of the one of the really big consistent themes that I've been hearing is individuals, people that said, well, I'm, I'm just one small person out in a sea of it, this, you know, fighting these huge repressive regimes that spend billions, trillions of dollars when we consider the military industrial complex, you know, on fighting wars overseas for no purpose, on spying on everybody, mm -hmm. as is the NSA's stated goal. What, what sort of, just a, a brief, brief message, just if you had only two minutes to talk to a person like that, what would you tell them, a person that just feels hopeless in the face of, in the face of everything that has come out and probably will keep coming out? Well, <clears throat> if you look at history, there are individuals, it's always individuals who make the difference. Um, sometimes there's a few individuals together, but sometimes it is a Daniel Ellsberg or an Edward Snowden. It is one or two people. I think right now we are in such a serious, uh, really serious, uh, you know, predicament, if you want to call it that, that it's going to take more than one force. It's going to take more than one thing. Uh, even ending the Vietnam War, it was not only the leaking of the Pentagon Papers. It was, uh, you know, Nixon's overreaction and the and the Woodward and Bernstein outing that. It was um, it was the, the marches in the street. It was like four things, five things, six things, all at the same time. Uh, everyone out there is capable of doing something either from the inside, you know, sometimes from the inside or from the outside. Martin Luther King was, was a great example of doing something from the outside. And so, and, he, and actually at the time, he was as vilified as Edward Snowden is right now, and maybe more. So we've got to take the long view, and, um, and everyone is capable of, capable of doing something, and it, it doesn't have to be heroic or big, but, you know, the Nike motto, just do something. Colleen, I would absolutely agree. I think all of us have the potential of a little bit of whistleblower in us. And when we face something at work, which we know is wrong, take a stand. It doesn't mean you have to go on the run, or it doesn't mean you have to go to prison. It means just taking a stand and drawing a line in the sand and saying, that is wrong, I'm not doing it. That is wrong, I'm challenging it. And I think everyone has that potential in them. And I think most people at this conference definitely have that potential in them. I'm just sitting here looking at this wonderful collection of people and wondering, who is the next Assange in this hall? Who is the next Edward Snowden? They are out there. There are people sitting at work now thinking about this and wondering how they're going to plan it. And we need to be in a position where we can protect them and support them when they come out to fight for all of our rights. I agree. And everybody has a different 
red line. In terms of the courage of your convictions, every one of us had a different moment of truth. A number of people like Tom, like myself, like Colleen, complained internally at least once, twice, three times, or in Tom's case, like 13 times, before deciding to do something else and go outside, either to Congress or to the media or to a body that was outside of our agency. So by all means, if your place of employment has a whistleblower policy, that's great. If they have one that works, that's even better. Um, but for yourself, you will know, you will know where the line is for you. I mean, for me, it became when it was someone else's life that was on the line, and I could not live with myself feeling like someone else might be killed because of what I didn't say. Um, that was it for me. For everybody, it's different, and it can, it can change and evolve throughout your life, but it's something to think about. Doesn't mean you're gonna be in a whistleblower situation necessarily, but it's better to be aware than just to be wearing blinders and acting like a bunch of lemmings. That's a veiled reference to the United States. Um, and not paying attention or deliberately blinding yourself. I just thought of one thing I have to add. Today's paper had the investigative results of from MIT about the suicide death of Aaron Schwartz. I don't know if anyone saw that. But MIT uh, professor said, uh, we didn't do anything wrong. We didn't uh, say that he should go to prison for his, for, for his accessing files. But what we did do is we let the FBI have free reign. And we, the quote, the end line is, we did not do ourselves proud. One of the things that we face is the age, the industrial age, that mentality characterized by centralized power and control is coming to an end. They're attempting to co-op the digital and internet age. The only way they know how to do that is to own the net. This is our age, not theirs. It's time to take down the digital fences. And we have all the power in this room and beyond to, to actually make that happen and to ensure going forward, we protect ourselves as sovereign individuals and as citizens in our countries who have fundamental rights that cannot be breached that cannot be violated and cannot be taken away from us. That's a citizenry standing up to those who would want power and control over us. The power of the network, the power of collaboration, the power of cooperation is far more powerful than simply control. And those who would dare own who we are, we're not gonna let them. And that's the challenge we face going forward from today. And then real quickly, uh, after, after we have raised comments, uh, we'll be taking questions. So if you could line up behind the microphone right now, uh, anybody who has questions, that would be great. Um, and then, Ray, would you like to take us out? Yeah, I just add here that uh, expertise we have. I see we, I'm looking at you. Conscience we have, but not quite as obviously. Courage. We aspire to courage. But you know what? What we need to be able to do is what you see personalized and concretized in these colleagues of mine. They stuck their neck out, okay? In the final analysis, if you can't get satisfaction or justice, you've, you've got to be able to stick your neck out. Now, I've been accused of having something against necks, okay? So what's, what's your problem with necks, McGovern, for Pete's sake? You know, well, I don't. I think right. they're a very convenient connection between head and, and torso. I have nothing against necks. But I ask you to consider this. If there is nothing for which you will risk that neck, then it has become your idol. And, and necks are not worthy of idol worship. And so in the final analysis, people step up to the plate. They risk their necks. And it doesn't take, you know, 100 people to do it. It takes these kinds of people 
It takes the Ed Snowden, Bradley Manning, Julian Assange kinds of people, and it takes your kind of people. And that's why this is such a big boost for my, my morale to see people not only technologically expert, but willing to listen and to learn and to see the signs of the times. Because the times are such, as has been described here, that may require you in some fashion or other to stick your neck out. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, like democracy versus the state, right? So you talked about Obama's promises and how he didn't, you know, uh, follow them up. So in in how much do you think that democracy is dead or on the attack at least? Because if you uh, even elect something like Obama and there seems to be a state behind him that actually uh, just propagates the same uh, government or choices that they had on the Bush, for instance. And yeah, so it's actually uh, poised against the battle between uh, democracy and states, so. Well, you know, secrecy erodes democracy. It eats it out from within. I've said it's, you know, it's a cancer in the United States, a cancer on the Constitution. What something has to give, what, what, t what usually gives is the very rights and freedoms that you're supposed to enjoy under democracy. But there is a fatal weakness, a fatal weakness of democracy, to be quite frank. That fatal weakness is whether or not the, the, citizenry, the citizenry themselves are willing to stand up for their things that supposedly protect them. Absent that, guess what fills the vacuum? So what's crucial here is, is owning who you are as a citizen and standing up for those rights. It's not free. Freedom is not free. I'm, I'm exhibit number one. It took tremendous amounts of effort, both for criminal defense and in the court of public opinion, to ensure the very rights and freedoms and liberties that I inherently, intrinsically had were not taken away from me and ended up in prison as, as the price. That's the cost one must bear in a democracy. But that's, that's the fundamental challenge that we have in, in our societies. And if we let others, or if others in secret or through coercion take it away from us, it's part of the human condition. What we need fundamentally is a new revolution. And in this context and in this space, it would be a digital revolution. You don't want the technology being used to subvert the citizenry and make them subjects of the state. You want it to actually enhance the rights and the freedoms and liberties of the very people under which they enjoy that freedom and those rights and those liberties. That's, that's what's necessary. Colleen. I just have something to add. Um, Obama, when he was a candidate, uh, wisely, because he was challenging power, he was speaking truth to power when he was a candidate, and he said, uh, that it is not a trade-off between civil liberties and security. Of course, every one of our politicians in the United States begins every speech, almost every speech, with something like, we have to give up our uh, constitutional rights in order to get security. In fact, Obama <clears throat> just said this. He completely reversed himself. A few days after Edward Snowden's revelations came out, he said, well, I can't give you 100% security and still give you privacy and convenience. That was his quote unquote. So this was a complete flip flop. And if there's anything you can take out of here is that anytime you hear someone, uh, Julian Assange, by the way, said something like this, that it wasn't a trade off. He said that in his talk as well. Please correct those people who believe that this is a utilitarian hypothetical and that you give up the, the, the rule of law in order to get some false sense of security. That has to be corrected because it is a fundamental lie at the bottom of all of the repression. Amen. I think I'd probably go further. I would say that actually democracy is pretty much already broken in most Western countries. We do not have a meaningful choice between different parties and different candidates. There has been a race for the center of the political ground, and there has been a subversion and corruption of the political process by globalized corporations. So I think we are now tipping dangerously into the era of what Mussolini 
defined as fascism, which is the merger of the corporate and the state. And that's what we have to fight now. I, a few months ago, I had a very interesting conversation with a couple who lives in Germany. And that couple knows who they are. They said, you don't understand in America. We live in Germany. We know we live in a post-fascist society. You live in a pre-fascist society and don't even know it. We now have a marriage of the corporate and, and surveillance state. We actually do on a global scale. We, that's a fundamental reality. It cannot stand democracy in the same room. It cannot. And so it has to eat it alive. And the only way you're going to keep it from eating it alive is you have to protect that which it wants to consume. You make yourself so subversive, you make yourself so unpalatable that they want to spit you out, okay? <laughs> That's what it's going to take because they're relentless. And when you have power, you, the last thing you're going to do is yield it to just a mere citizen. So you crowdsource yourselves. You crowdsource the truth. You crowdsource freedom. You crowdsource liberty. That's what you do. So you must, as you leave this conference over the next couple of days, think about in your life where you can influence, where you have an effect, where the working surfaces of who you are meet all the edges of, all, of your entire personal and professional life. Each and every edge. What will you do to affect that change? Let me just add a quick thing here. The, the crowdsourcing doesn't have to be a big crowd. These things go in cycles. In two years, we'll be celebrating the 800th anniversary of the time when a few, just a, a little crowd of English noble people told King John that they had enough of this stuff and they were going to make sure that they had a Magna Carta which would secure and guarantee some rights, including habeas corpus. Now, two years from now, when we celebrate the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, uh, it's really up to us whether that will be an inquest, a funeral, or whether we'll have something really special to celebrate, that this time a bigger crowd source, a bigger crowd stood up in a, in a time of peril and said, no, nope, we're not going to let this happen. King John, you're going to be circumscribed. You're going to be limited in your powers over us. We're going to speak up. We're going to do what we can do just as expertly as those, those thugs you have in these governmental agencies. Can I just make one follow-up comment to that? I would suggest that in the UK now, where we have um, internment without trial and where we have secret courts, which are purely Kafkaesque, where you have no defense, no representation, you can't even hear the evidence against you, that actually those nobles in, 2000, uh, in 1215 had more rights after the Magna Carta was signed than everybody in the UK now has. We have lost even the right guaranteed of habeas corpus in the UK. Mm. We are going backwards at a rapid rate. So I think for the anniversary, we should be out there on the streets and just taking action in whatever way we can and pushing back. It's not mm. a celebration, it's a fight back. Um, I have a question about uh, what we can do if you're, if you're not yet a whistleblower. And I want to specifically talk about, um, I think the main problem with whistleblowers now is uh, they, the governments have been really successful in uh, getting fear into society to, to be a whistleblower. And I think all of us, what can we do to make it safe to be a whistleblower? For example, uh, Edward Snowden, he asked for political asylum in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands government said, no, we cannot do that because we have the rule book here, and you can only get politi political asylum if you are already in the Netherlands. So we're not going to help you. And I think, what can we do to make it safe? Mm. Go to WikiLeaks. <laughs> I mean, there need to be much better whistleblower protections. You brought up a very important point, that any time you hear the government fear-mongering, I mean, that's what they do every time they're caught with a hand in their cookie jar or taking away your right. They say, oh, we're in a, ver we're in a worldwide global war on terrorism. 
if you want your privacy, you're going to end up having the blood of soldiers on your hands. The next terrorist attack is going to be on your back. And that kind of fear mongering, they still engage in it. But call them out on it. Hello, 9-11 was a, more than a decade ago. And yet you continue to use this fear mongering to try to get people to give up their rights. I mean, again, it's about calling people out on it. I don't think it's easy to just say, okay, I'm going to be a whistleblower at work, but just speak your truth. Call people out on their bullshit. And when they're, when they're making these arguments that you have to have this false dichotomy of liberty or security, as Ben Franklin said, if you have to choose between the two, you deserve neither, I'm paraphrasing. Um, when you hear these government memes that's all they are. And they're really tired and they're getting really old. And you can see them played out over and over again when Snowden made his disclosures. The first thing that always happens as a whistleblower and a whistleblower attorney, I can tell you, is smear the whistleblower. They pathologize them, caricature them. They've got to be out for fame or profit or for revenge, or because they're a narcissist. No, they're out to educate the public about crimes that your government is committing. So it's important to just, whether it's by writing a letter or signing a petition or just having a conversation about it, or through your own work, everyone's got to play to their strength. I'm a lawyer, not a techie, but I play to my strength and that's why I am representing people. That is my strength. Other people, you guys, techies, that's your strength. If you're a documentarian, if you're an artist, if you're a poet, whatever you are, you can play an activist role through your own daily life. I and mean, that would be my advice. Live meaningfully. I This, this afternoon I attended another um, talk and there was an idea that uh, you should, and I, I hesitate to say this because I'm not that fond myself of politicians, but the idea was to adopt a politician. Um, you have to, if you develop a personal relationship uh, to some extent with somebody who has a, a bit of power, um, for instance, in the United States, going back 25 years, there was one senator who had a series of really good whistleblowers that came to his office. So he got convinced that whistleblower protection was valuable. One whistleblower found, was told that the Pentagon was paying $1,000 for every toilet seat. Uh, another whistleblower came to him and said the FBI lab that claims to be the top... Uh, police laboratory in the world has never been accredited. So this, this senator now is actually a, 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 a watchdog and a proponent of whistleblowing. And I would encourage, someone in this prior panel said that Germany has, has adopted this uh, proposal already and uh, activists uh, are trying to make some impact upon their politicians by developing a relationship. Uh, first, thanks to all of you for taking a stand for uh, humanity and just basic human rights. I think the society is missing such conscious and strong-worded political individuals. Um, my question has to do uh, about uh, defense con contractors. I, I heard some of you mention them, and uh, obviously, like Edward Snowden comes out of a defense contractor. So what would you have to say to uh, people in this crowd that uh, have been approached to be recruited by them? or work for them and maybe to a further extent like their involvement in the hacker community as, you know. don't check your ethics and your conscience at the door i recognize it's extraordinarily tempting particularly when they're dangling lots of money in front of you to say yes i'll join their side i mean i'm i'm in a very difficult position when people come to me personally and say do you recommend that you go work as a military contractor? I said, if you make that choice, know precisely what you're getting yourself into. Because you will be faced at some point, no doubt, as many of my colleagues were and chose not to say anything and remain silent, you'll be confronted with the reality of abuse and fraud and waste 
and what will you do? The tendency is to defend the system, but that actually works against who we are. So you have to make the choice. That choice is what you own. It's not someone else's choice, it's your choice. So, you know, the defense contractors are highly incentivized right now, particularly in with regard to this incredibly unholy alliance between them and the government, to persist the existential threats, to persist the problems, because it's a, it's a pipeline of money from us, from the, from the public, okay, to them and their shareholders and their private bank accounts. That's not the kind of society that I wish to live in, frankly. It's not. And so part of this shift is saying, what do I actually commit to? What type of future do I wish to keep? Because that's ultimately the choices you're making. Those choices have consequences. So that's what I would say. And I used to be a contractor. I used to be a contractor with Booz Allen, very similar to Edward Snowden. I actually left Booz Allen because I was confronted by the distinct prospect. In order to remain in the management chain, and I was on the fast track to partner, that I would have to compromise my core principles and I would have to engage in unethical, unethical behavior as a contractor to, to pull as much money as I could through unethically for Booz Allen. And I chose not to do that. I recognized once I got to management level that the management core was rotten at the very core. And so I made a choice to leave. I gave up a lot. And I became, you know, I went into a, a very small dot com, but I had much more freedom, a lot more flexibility, and I could actually live with myself and get up in the morning. Other people make different choices, but every choice you make has consequences. Let me just uh, add here, I think uh, for those of you who are younger, uh, you face a gradation of choices. You're going to have a whole bunch of chances to make choices. When people come up to me and talk about intelligence analysis, which is sort of a pauper uh, <laughs> compared to the money kinds that's been involved in here, they said, well, Mr. McGovern, uh, from what all you say, I was thinking of, of trying to become an analyst in the S Central Intelligence Agency. Sounds very exciting. So I said, I have a little routine. I said, well, do you, do you have integrity? And they <laughs> were like, well, yeah. Well, do you have courage? Courage? <laughs> well, by all means, do it. Because that's what we need, okay? Now, if after two or three years you find out that your integrity won't stand up to what they're asking you to do, then you have the courage to quit. You take your little savings with you and you go find an honest job. But, you know, if nobody with honesty or integrity or an ethical outlook on life joins these organizations, you know, my view is that we're even worse off than we started because you know who, you know who the, the guys are going to get in there and the women who will get up to the top, that the kind of women, too much of whom we've already seen in these top jobs in the corporations and in places like the National Security Agency. If we rise to the challenge that you set before us today and the technologists among us are able to organize the social media and the poets among us are able to craft a message and the lawyers among us are able to craft legislation that's ready for the next time the whistle is blown, what can we hope to expect? Uh, could you just repeat the last part of that question a little more slowly? What can we hope to expect if we rise to the challenge that you've set before us today? Well, for those of us living in the U.S., I hope we could expect to be able to save our democracy because right now we are a nation in decline. Being secret is completely antithetical to a free and open democratic society. And we're at a pivotal juncture where we need to decide what kind of republic we want to keep and how badly we want it. We are supposed to have a country, a government run by the people, not the other way around. The operations of the government are supposed to be public and your personal life should be private, but instead it's the other way around. So the hope would be that if people can rise to the challenge, we can start to rein in all the excess and abuse and illegality that has occurred in 
droves after 9-11. I think Edward Snowden started that, but we need to finish it. Right now, I think the polls are kind of 50-50, maybe 60-40 in terms of support for having the conversation. Every politician in America welcomes the idea of having a conversation and having the debate, but they want to totally fry the guy who got the conversation started. And that, again, makes no sense. We need to have the conversation that we should have been having over the last decade. And it needs to be a robust conversation that the government allows to happen rather than censors in every way it can figure out. For example, there was supposed to be a hearing the other day held by Congressman Alan Grayson to hear from Glenn Greenwald, who published Snowden's Revelations for The Guardian. And one of my clients was going to be a witness at that hearing. Obama pulled a stunt. He, at the same time as the hearing, convened a meeting of all the House of Representative Democrats at the same exact time, and it was done for one reason only, to blunt that hearing. But you can only do that so much. The hearing is going to be rescheduled. This is a conversation that we need to have and that we're going to have. He just doesn't realize it yet, but people need to be persistent because I'm not shutting up and neither are the people I represent, um, though some of them, th at least the ones under active criminal investigation, should be a little quieter right now. <laughs> but, um, but really. Look, look it's, it's real simple for me. You have a number of people on this stage who stood up because they knew it was beyond just who they were. There's a, fam there's a famous saying from Spock for those who follow Star Trek in the second Star Trek movie called The Wrath of Khan where he sacrificed his life for, for the sake of the crew of the Enterprise. And Kirk, Kirk couldn't figure, well, wrote down and say, why Spock, why? He said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. This is a much bigger thing. It's much bigger than any one of us, but it takes the actions of every individual to make that crucial difference. So the fundamental question you must ask yourself in your life and in your context and where your strengths are and who you relate to and all the connections you have is if not me, then who? And if not now, when? Because it ain't going to be the person out there. It's you. Um, you ask what to expect. I just want to answer on a more personal level, I think. Because if you choose to take that stand, if you choose to blow the whistle or draw the, draw the line in the sand, you will have moments of great fear and stress and isolation and inevitably paranoia. But also, you will do what feels right for you, and you will end up living a rich and varied and amazing life in the sense of meeting so many interesting people all over the place, like-minded fellow citizens who will rally to your cause and help protect you. And I cannot, I cannot regret the richness and the vividness of my life since I've blown the whistle. And I would have regretted forever if I'd sat in that office in MI5 and just kept my head down, followed orders, and allowed them to get away with crimes. So that, I think, is the payoff. And the more people who do it, the more people who come together, the more powerful we are. You have in your hands very interesting technology. It's a space I've lived in for many years. Technology is benign. So channel it for the right purpose. Channel it for purposes that make a difference in our lives. Channel it for social change. Challenge it to protect the very people who stand up to make the difference in calling out wrongdoing and calling out illegality on the state and corporations. Channel it to make a difference. Channel it to it help us protect those who communicate that which we need to disclose and expose on an even larger scale. You have that power. You really do. So channel it. <clears throat> Uh, and I'll just add one thing that Tom mentioned before. Uh, certainly, democracy in the United States is on the line and, and we hope can be restored, but it, it's a lot more than that. Because if we give up a system of the rule of law, how are we going to possibly face these technological challenges that are coming in uh, all kinds of ways, climate, in technology? The whole world needs to really uh, deal with the real problems. Not this, not this fighting against uh, the. Oh, okay. 
So in, in any event, I think that it's, it's, uh, the consequences are for everyone in the world right now. I would just finally add, um, for a lot of us, being a whistleblower, it, when someone calls you a traitor or a turncoat or a terrorist sympathizer or whatever they called Bradley Manning in terms of being broken and fragile and whatever they've called Edward Snowden in terms of being some moral narcissist, the thing that really helped, somebody had my back. Senator Edward Kennedy, I don't have a voting representative in Congress. I live in DC, I was completely screwed. But for some reason he came to my cause and it really helped at a critical time. And you can have other people's backs because when the government says, oh yeah, he's a traitor, turncoat, all this name calling, name calling is the lowest form of argumentation in debate circles for a reason. What you can do is step up and say, no, I'm going to continue to be friends with this person, talk to this person, support this person, and have their back. If you're not the whistleblower, you can at least support other whistleblowers in myriad different ways financially, by signing petitions, by writing letters, by speaking out. So when you see a whistleblower getting absolutely hammered, as is the case with Bradley Manning and Snowden, Bradley Manning's prison address is on the Bradley Manning Support Network. My client, John Kiriakou's address, is on the Defend John K page on Facebook. Snowden, information is not available yet, but funds are being set up to help him do so. Do something. Um, what kind of arguments do you make against people who will say, uh, yeah, our government needs to be able to do this secret stuff and we can't know about it because there are other bigger superpowers in the world that will take abuse uh, or advantage of us uh, when they can't? That's interesting, actually. I did an interview with German TV about the um, telecoms companies spying um, on behalf of the spies. And that was exactly a question they gave me as well. And I think what you have to see is it's sort of a, a mirror image, the cyber side of things and the real world side of things. Now, in the real world, under most or all international law, it is illegal to wage a war of aggression against another country. You are allowed legally to defend yourself against an imminent threat, and that's it. What we're seeing in the cyber world is they are, there is no imminent threat against these big, you know, from these big nation states, apart from, most notoriously, the US and Israel, where we saw the Stuxnet virus being let out into the wild, attacking the Iranian civil nuclear facilities, and then just going rogue out there in the wild. It can be mutated, it can be changed, it can be abused, it can be used. This is a first act of real international cyber warfare, and that was committed by the US. So for them to try and argue, oh, we've got to protect ourselves, turn ourselves into surveillance states to protect ourselves from Russia or from China or Iran or whatever, it's just bogus. It's trying to shift the blame. They are already the aggressors in the real world and in the cyber world. And really, I mean, to the extent that we want to protect ourselves in the U.S. from Chinese hackers, what, what the heck does that have to do with gathering all the digital data on perfectly innocent hundreds of millions of Americans? Nothing. And the rest of the world. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, right, that's part of the American exceptionalism, we own the world thing. But um, really, look at the problem. I mean, if they really cared about the Chinese hacker, Chinese DOS attacks, there are ways to prevent that. But of the ways I've heard of, none of them entailed spying on perfectly innocent people. Well, we're, we're about out of time, um, but as I said earlier, we were looking for solutions, things that we could all do to contribute in large and small ways. And, and Ray, I think you have a way that everybody here can immediately contribute to the cause. You know, just picking up from some of the things just, just said here, uh, there is an incredible reservoir of respect that you will enjoy among colleagues that you have never met yet. When I became a quasi-whistleblower, five alumni from the CIA immediately joined forces with me. We grew to 75. We called ourselves veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. 
because there wasn't much sanity in Washington in early 2003, and we became ipso facto VIPs, okay? Now, uh, what am I saying here? I'm saying that there's an incredible alumni and alumnae at your disposal. You won't always know it. Uh, my colleagues at the CIA in the analysis division uh, won't call me, won't email me, they never have for 12 years. And why? Well, I suspected why now I know why. But if I go to a concert and I see them in the men's room, they say, Ray, Ray, keep up going, man. That's really great what you're doing. We're all watching what you're doing here. Keep it up. <laughs> or I go to a funeral. And one of my distinguished colleagues, who now is a super great officer, his wife comes up to me and she looks and makes sure her husband says, Way to go, Ray. You keep going. We need to do it. We can do it. And then I go up to her husband and I say, Frank, it's really good to see you. He says, well, it's good to see you too, Ray, but now I have to report this conversation because, because you're considered a journalist. <laughs> so it reaches ridiculous proportions, but you know there's enough evidence that will come your way to know that you've not only done the right thing personally, but there are a whole bunch of people out there that respect you greatly but are afraid to show it, okay? That's okay, as long as you have that kind of knowledge that you've done the right thing. Now, uh, Sam Adams, whom I spoke about uh, the first day here, the analyst who counted up the number of Vietnamese communists under arms and found that twice as many as the generals would allow to be in their order of battle in Saigon, uh, he fought the system, but he fought within the system. He was diddled, he was blocked. He went to the Inspector General of the CIA, Inspector General of Defense Department for four or five years. Finally, when Dan Ellsberg issued forth with the, with the Vietnamese, uh, with the uh, Pentagon Papers and was on, on trial, Sam came to me and he said, you know, Ray, <laughs> this, is, this is really ridiculous. He says, they're going to hang Dan Ellsberg for releasing the falsified figures on enemy battle. He says, I'm going to Los Angeles and testify, okay? Now, he did, but of course, Dan got off because of Nixon's excesses. Well, the point is here that Sam died a very early age, 56, I think it was, with terrible regret that he let himself be diddled, and, and that was halfway through the war. And so we set up this, this award. Uh, we called it Sam Adams Associates for Integrity and Intelligence. And when Colleen Rowley did that incredibly courageous thing by writing a letter to the director of the FBI, two years, mind you, two years before she qualified for retirement, that's guts, okay? She became the first awardee of the Sam Adams Associates Award for Integrity and Intelligence. Tom Drake, Jesslyn Reddick were the, the two for two years ago. We had uh, a substantive officer, uh, Tom Finger, who supervised the, now get this, supervised the National Intelligence Estimate, which played a huge role in stopping Cheney and Bush from making war on Iran during their last year in office. If you don't believe me, read Bush's memoirs. We said that Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003. Do the math. I'm good at arithmetic. Ten years, okay? Ten years ago. Now, when that got out, Bush was distraught, and he wrote in his memoir, why did they say that? This took the military option out of my hands. And then this quote, for how could I authorize committing our armed forces to attack Iran when the intelligence community says that Iran has no active nuclear weapons program? End quote. Well, bummer. <laughs> bummer, you know? He says it in his memoir. So the point is simply that the last award we gave in January of this year in Oxford, at the Oxford, at the Oxford Forum there, it was to Tom Finger. He was the supervisor of that estimate. So we've had all kinds of people winning this award, okay? Now, the last award that we just gave was a month ago, and we gave it to a fellow named Edward Snowden. And what a, 
what an uplift that was because it was at a time when Edward Snowden was not very popular with anybody in our country except people who knew what the, knew which end was up. Now, we have a problem. We, we publicized this award and it got out to people who, who, read, who want to read the real, real stuff, but we have not been able to present the award with the little figurine, the, the equivalent of an Oscar, which, by the way, is a corner brightener candlestick holder. That's what each one of our awardees gets. It's not very, very, very expensive, uh, but that's what we give, a candlestick that brightens the corner. Uh, we have not been able to give that to Edward Snowden, but we're hell-bent and determined to do so. Now, we thought we might be able to do it, like flying from Amsterdam to Moscow, but things have moved at too quick a pace, and we don't know exactly where we stand right now. What we do know is that we're going to have... Need to, <laughs> none of us are very wealthy by choice, okay? What we're going to need is a lot of help in funding the travel that we'll take to go to Moscow or wherever uh, Edward uh, winds up in, in Russia uh, to, to present the award with appropriate fanfare, we think. Isn't it amazing how Russia enjoys the high moral ground on this? Isn't that incredibly, incredibly ironic? So, uh, oh, this just by way of saying that we are just really tickled pink is what we would say in the U.S. We're just very, very pleased to have made this decision to award him this year's, this year's award for, 2000 and th for 2013. And uh, uh, some of us, maybe all of us, will end up going to, to Russia, and uh, for that, we're going to need some, some help and, and also uh, uh, just kind of moral support to make sure that uh, we have a, a, some backing among people who think in the same way we do. Um, I, I truly hope that you will honor the sacrifices of everybody on this panel. If you're able to contribute, please honor their sacrifices. Please honor the sacrifices of Edward Snowden. We will have a donation jar in the bar in order to support this trip to give Edward Snowden the award that he deserves. I really hope that you will spread the message throughout the camp. Please encourage people to donate so that we can make this possible. And please, can we have a huge, huge round of applause to honor everybody on this panel who came here to speak with us and for the sacrifices they've made to protect our individual freedoms. Please, 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 huge round of applause. Nice. Stand up here. <laughs> <laughs>